One of the most unusual places in all of Israel is an intersection in a small town named Abu Ghosh, which is located about seven miles outside the city of Jerusalem. You will not believe what is located at this intersection. It varies from the ridiculous to the deeply spiritual. For an up close look, stay tuned. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Reagan. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. This is going to be the last in a series of 11 programs that have taken you on a pilgrimage throughout the Holy Land. We started in Tel Aviv at Independence Hall, and then journeyed to the coast of, up the coast of Israel to the Crusader capital of Akko, located on the border with Lebanon. From there we went to Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee, where we spent two days exploring the towns Jesus ministered in that are located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. From Tiberias we headed south toward Jerusalem, making stops in Nazareth, the ancient fortress of Megiddo, and the incredible archaeological site called Beit Shan. After arriving in Jerusalem we explored the old city including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the sites on Mount Zion, and the fascinating Jewish quarter. The next day we headed to the Dead Sea where we explored King Herod's fortress of Masada, and visited the site where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The next days we visited sites in the new part of Jerusalem including the Mount Herzl Cemetery, the Holocaust Museum called Yad Vashem, and the Dead Sea Scrolls Museum. We spent a free day exploring Jerusalem on our own, and then on our last day we spent the morning at the Garden Tomb, which is the Protestant site for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Later that day, en route to the airport for our flight back home, we stopped off in the small Arab village of Abu Ghosh to visit the Church of the Ark of the Covenant and to eat lunch at a Messianic Jewish community called Yad Vahashmona. If you have missed any of these past 10 programs you can find them on our website at lamblion.com or on sites like hischannel.com or lightsource.com. In this last program we are going to focus on the very tiny Arab village of Abu Ghosh that is located about 7 miles west of Jerusalem on the highway to Tel Aviv. Welcome back to Christ in Prophecy and the pilgrimage we are taking through the Holy Land. Now for the rest of this program I want to focus on the small Arab village of Abu Ghosh that is actually a suburb of modern day Jerusalem. And even more specifically I want to focus your attention on an amazing intersection in the village that is famous for the variety of things that are located there. But first let me give you a little background about the town. In the Bible the village of Abu Ghosh is known as Kiriath Jerem. It is the place where the sacred Ark of the Covenant came to rest for many years after it was stolen by the Philistines in the battle of Ebenezer. According to 1 Samuel 7 the uh, Ark was stored in the house of Abinadad on a hill. That site is marked today by a church that is located on the highest point of the village. The village's name was changed in the 16th century after an Arab clan called Abu Ghosh settled there and took over the highway from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem charging travelers tolls to pass through the village. Now with that brief background about the village I want to shift our attention to one intersection of the village. And the first thing located at this intersection believe it or not is the Elvis Presley service station. <laughs> That's right. It is a gasoline station and diner that is dedicated to the memory of Elvis Presley in the parking lot are two oversized statues of Elvis. Inside the walls are plastered with Elvis album covers, and Elvis music is played 24 hours a day. Directly across the street from the Elvis service station is the location of Israel's Hollywood, where the many TV shows and movies are made. Also at this same intersection you will find a Messianic Moshav or communal village that looks like an Alpine village because it is constructed entirely of lumber donated by Christians in Finland. The village is called Yad Hashmona. But the site at this intersection that we want to explore in depth is the Church of the Ark of the Covenant. Welcome 
back to Christ in Prophecy and our pilgrimage through the Holy Land. We are about to visit the Church of the Ark of the Covenant that was built in 1924 in the small Arab village of Abu Ghosh, located about seven miles west of Jerusalem. The church is maintained and operated by a very hospitable order of French nuns. And now, let's go to the church. We will uh, begin with the uh, story that Elan was telling you out there before we came inside. Our guide. You will find the story in 1 Samuel, beginning with uh, chapter 4. And it says there in 1 Samuel 4, verse 1, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. Now, this was before they had a king. This was before King Saul it was in the final years of Samuel's ministry. And instead of trusting in God, they did something incredible. They decided to trust in the Ark of the Covenant, using it like a rabbit's foot as a good luck charm. Their reasoning was, you know, if we take, go into the Holy of Holies and violate it, take the Ark out, take it out into battle, God would never allow us to lose. <laughs> they had a surprise in store. So they raided the Holy of Holies took the Ark of the Covenant out into battle. And God, of course, was enraged by this. And so, He allowed the Philistines to capture the Ark. They took the Ark on a long journey. And that journey is recorded here in 1 Samuel 4 through 1 Samuel 7 or 1 Samuel 6. They uh, took it mainly down to their capital city of Ashdod, where they put it in their temple next to their fish god named Dagon. And every morning they would come in and the fish god would be on the floor on his face and the ark would be sitting there. They would put the fish god back up and come back the next morning he's on his face. They finally decided there was something about this box. Uh, they decided it was a hot box and they wanted to get rid of it. So they put it on a cart and started it on its way. Arrived in one village, you remember, and people came over and opened it and looked in, and they were struck immediately by all kinds of tumors. So it really was a hot box. They finally decided to just point it in the direction of Israel and just let it go on its way with the oxen pulling the thing. And ultimately, it ended up right here in what we say in English is Kiriath Jerem, but there's no J in Hebrew, so they call it Kiriath Jerem. And this is where it landed. You'll see there in 1 Samuel chapter 6, the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines for seven months. And then you'll see that in chapter 6 and verse 19, he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. They sent it on to Kiriath Jerem. Verse 20, the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? To whom shall it go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. And then the men of this city, Kiriath Jerem, came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill, notice on the hill, and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. This is the traditional site of where they put the ark. It's up on the hill overlooking the whole area. And there's some good archaeological evidence that this was where it was. And they have built this uh, Catholic church uh, in this site. It's called the Church of the Ark of the Covenant. And it says in the next verse there, it was that the ark remained in Kiriath Jerem a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. We know that it was here more than 20 years. When it refers to it being there 20 years, this is Samuel writing. And it was during the 20 years, the last 20 years of Samuel's life that the ark was here. But it continued to remain here for a total of 70 years. It was here during the last 20 years of Samuel's life. It was here during the 40 years that Saul reigned. And it was here during the first 10 years that Jesus, uh, that uh, David reigned before he became the king of all of Israel, when he was just the king of Judah. And it is quite a testimony of the spiritual apostasy of the time, of how far these people had strayed from God. Because when they conquered the ark, 
the Philistines went on to Shiloh and destroyed the tabernacle of Moses. So it had to be rebuilt and it was put up at a short place just about five miles from here. Yet nobody cared enough to come over here and get the Ark of the Covenant and take it five miles over there and put it in the Holy of Holies. That's how they just could care less. It was shortly after this that they demanded of Samuel a king. And Samuel said, you have a king. Your king is God Almighty. And they said, yeah, but we want to be like all the other nations around us. And he said, yeah, and, and you get a king and he's going to tax you to death. He's going to send your children into war. He's going to mistreat you. He's going to do all these horrible things to you like all the kings around. They said, we don't care. We want to be like everybody else. It's been a cry of the Jewish people throughout their history. We just want to be like everyone else. We don't want to, you know, you ever see the uh, movie or the play uh, Fiddler on the Roof? What does he sing over and over and over again? Oh, why did you choose us? Why didn't you choose somebody else? Why can't we be like everybody else? And that's what they were saying at this time. They had really strayed a long way from the Lord. But then Saul passes from the scene. David is made king of Judah. Then a few years later he's made king of all of Israel. And when that happens a very significant thing occurs. David makes a vow before the Lord that I've referred to a number of times. It's in Psalm 132. You might want to look, take a look at that and mark it because it's an important vow. Psalm 132, David makes a vow. He says, Yahweh remember David and all his afflictions, how he swore to Yahweh and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for Yahweh, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. To me that sort of indicates uh, uh, very strongly uh, what it means when David was a man after God's own heart. I've already talked to you about that in Ein Gedi. But here's another illustration. He's now the king of all of Israel and usually when you're king of all of Israel then you uh, of any nation. The first thing you're going to do is do a census. You're going to do a, a computation of how much wealth you've got. You're going to look at your military resources. You're going to think about going out and conquering new lands. Not David. His first thought was God. His first thought was getting that nation back to God. Getting them on the right track with God. Getting the Ark of the Covenant to a place where it should be. And, and it's interesting what he did. He came here to this place and he took the Ark and he took it to Jerusalem to Mount Moriah and he put a simple tent and put the ark in it and it said he had the opening front of it open at all times. So instead of the high priest going in once a year and sprinkling the blood on it for a period of time there David would go and they would dance before the ark. They would sing before the ark. He would, he would lounge before the ark and write poetry and write songs. David began to change radically the whole worship of Israel. Prior to David the worship of Israel, Israel had always been ritual worship. It was a heavy worship. It was a worship of sacrifice, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. There are only spontaneous times in the history of Israel where there was any joy and celebration in worship like when Miriam broke out in joy after the destruction of the Egyptian forces in the Red Sea and she began to dance with a tambourine and to sing. There were spontaneous times like that, but that was not a part of the, of the ritual of Israel. It was not until David that they introduced shouting, dancing, hand clapping, singing. And if any of you as elders or as pastors have ever been involved in a church where you tried to change the worship, you know that it is like walking on dynamite. You've got to take it very slowly, very carefully. I always get amused and very sad at young guys right out of seminary who go out to some little country church that they're the first time they're the pastor and the first thing they do is take all the song books out and throw them away and they put up a screen and a projector and the next thing they know they have everybody please stand through the entire worship service and sing these words on the screen and the next week they're looking for a new job. Because you can't do that without a lot of teaching and a lot of preparation Changing worship is just dynamite in most congregations. And it was in Israel. I mean, think of this. David changing radically the whole worship of the nation. And it's interesting that we're told over in the Chronicles that God affirmed his change through two prophets, Nathan and Gad. 
that God spoke to those prophets and said, tell the people that the innovations that David is putting into worship are approved by Almighty God. And I think that's interesting because David was a prophet. He wrote prophetic literature. He wrote Psalm 22, a a detailed description of the crucifixion of the Messiah. He was a prophet. But when it came to changing the worship, God spoke to two other prophets, Nathan and Gad, and said, you tell the people David is justified in doing this. The Old Testament principle, the witness of two or more people. That's, God knew it was going to be a, a very delicate thing. And so David began to introduce passion into the worship of Jerusalem. And for a time, For a period of time there were two worship centers, one here in Jerusalem and one a few miles north of Jerusalem. And at at Jerusalem there was joy and there was celebration. At the other place they had rebuilt the tabernacle of Moses and there was uh, the ritual and the sacrifices, but there was joy and celebration uh, in Jerusalem where David was leading in the worship. We have the story of David moving the ark and if you'll turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 6 you will find the story of him moving it. He came out here and started moving it. As you know as they were walking along with it Uzzah put his hand on the ark and was struck dead. And they just put the thing down and walked away and left it for a while. And then David I guess uh, sat down with them and talked about the proper way to handle this. And they came back, verse 12, So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Abedidim to the city of David with gladness. And look at how, what a passion this man had for God. David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. In other words, he took off his kingly garments. He took off all of his majestic garments and he only had only the undergarment, the ephod. And he's dancing before the ark. David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, with the sound of trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, uh, Michal, or probably his way, Michal, who was David's wife, uh, Saul's daughter looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. I mean, the king out there acting like a crazy man. Verse 20, Then David returned to bless his household, and Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And so David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler over the people, the Lord over Israel. Therefore I will play music before the Lord. (laughs) Then his next statement, And I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. Honey, you ain't seen nothing yet. I am really going to cut loose. And... uh, You know, she was struck barren because of that. Because she criticized the worship of David, she was struck barren. And you know, I really think that we need to take that very, very seriously. I I remember when I was a kid growing up, probably 10, 12 years old, there was a Pentecostal church down the street from us. That was back in the 40s. And that was back when Pentecostals were considered to be ignorant and uneducated people, people who lived on the wrong side of the railroad track. And we made fun of them, terrible fun of them, because they had the audacity to stand while they were worshiping or to raise their hands while they were worshiping. And and, and we just made terrible fun of them. Well, let me tell you something. Don't ever, ever make fun of someone else's worship. That is between them and God and not for us to judge. Uh, Because when when you get into judging somebody else's worship, uh, the Lord can take some actions that might not be very happy for you as He did with David's wife. Well, we've done a lot of filming here at this place. It's a very special place. And uh, I even did a dance out here one day to show how David danced before the ark, or at least how I imagined him dancing before the ark. But one of the most unusual experiences that I've ever had here is I had a group a number of years ago, one of the first times we came here. And for some reason or other, I just suddenly got the impulse to lead a particular song. And the song is number 61 on your list. It's one we listened to. I I loved it. We listened to it as we were coming over here. We're standing on holy ground. John Storns was singing that. 
And so I asked the group, I said, why don't we stand and sing this song? Now notice the words of it. This, I, I'll never get over this. We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. Let us praise Jesus now. We're standing in His presence on holy ground. Folks, as I began to sing that, I said, we are standing on holy ground. I lifted my eyes and hands up and said, and I know that there are angels all around. I nearly fainted. Look at the ceiling, completely solid with angels. I still get goosebumps every time I think about it. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord. We are standing. I sincerely hope that our series of 11 programs about a pilgrimage to the Holy Land has been a blessing to you. And I hope they have whetted your appetite to go to the Holy Land and see the sights for yourself. You know, folks, I have been 45 times and I still get excited about each visit and I still discover and learn new things each time I go. I went the first time in 1979 and it has been amazing to watch the development of the nation over that period of time. Forests have been planted. Valleys have been drained of swamps and turned into agricultural production centers. Cities have been built. The desert has been reclaimed. And major archaeological discoveries have been made that confirm the historical records contained in the Bible. And all this has happened in the midst of constant wars, terrorist attacks, and unrelenting international opposition. Can there be any doubt that God has His finger on this nation? Well, I have said it before and I will say it again. A pilgrimage to the Holy Land can be a very spiritually enriching experience. If you have never been, I hope you will make it a point to go. It will bring the Bible alive for you. It will strengthen your faith and it will draw you closer to the Lord. I want to share some pilgrimage testimonies with you, but before I do so, let me say, I hope our program has been a blessing to you and that you will be back with us next week, the Lord willing. Until then, this is Dave Reagan saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. This trip to Israel was the most amazing trip I have ever been on. It really and truly is. I, much more than I expected. I, it was just awesome. I would, I would love to come back again. It was on my bucket list and I'm just so glad I came. Even from the first day when we were in Tel Aviv, I believe, and went up to that prayer room. That was just so serene and I have such a deeper appreciation for the Israelites and what these people are going through, surrounded by these countries that just are so awful and so evil. And um, I know that I will be praying for them every day. And I have such a soft spot in my heart now for them. And going down last night, it was so exciting with everybody dancing and spraying each other with shaving cream. And just, they, they had such joy. And for the Memorial Day experience, I. I think you know about our country, and I think about their their love for the people that fight, and their caring, and, and how they celebrate, and and really take care of each other, and they really want to honor each other, and just you know be a be a part of it, and never forget. And we do that also, but they just seem to do it even more so than we do back home. And I just um, I just I just love being here, and I. I didn't expect it to be so green and beautiful, the flowers and the greenery and what they've done. They're an amazing people. And uh, one of my biggest prayers is that just so many more of them will come to know Jesus in their heart and that that word can spread and that their hearts will be on fire for our Lord. And, um, shalom. Um, we decided, my sister, my friend, and my brother-in-law, rather suddenly to make this trip. At least we thought it was suddenly, but I expect the good Lord had been planning it for a while. And we um, 
came thinking one thing about Israel and one thing about the Bible, and it just came up like a picture book that things folded out of. It became so three-dimensional. It became so meaningful. And we were astounded. We kept saying, I didn't know that. I never knew that. And suddenly we were all scrambling for our Bibles. <laughs> and uh, what we thought we knew sometimes wasn't quite right, but we just learned constantly. But it wasn't just learning, it was fun. And the people that were on the tour with us were such a delight. And we just all just fit together just so beautifully. And um, I guess, you know, the thing that for me was the big thing is that I was walking across the Temple Mount and it was like the world fell away and I realized Peter walked here, Jesus walked here, Paul walked here, now Julie's walking here. What an amazing thing. And I think that might have been my high point of the whole trip. But every day we would say that and we would have a new high point. So really, it was the best trip I've ever made and I can't imagine another one ever being this good. And another thing, we did, we did devotionals and we prayed. I've never been on a tour where we did that. So it was just the best of experiences. This is, I've been fortunate to be on two pilgrimages with David and they've both been awesome. And it's like an onion. The first time you're peeling layers and you're learning things and you come the second time and there's just as many things you're learning it is very valuable, it's very enriching to any Christian to enrich their walk with Christ. Ten of Dr. Reagan's sermons delivered in Israel have been put together in one DVD album titled Sermons from the Holy Land. The sermons included in this album are The Miracle of Israel, delivered at Independence Hall in Tel Aviv. The Evil of Replacement Theology, delivered at the Crusader Castle in Aco. The Healing Ministry of Jesus, delivered at the Galilee village of Chorazin. The Virgin Birth, delivered at the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth. The Wars of the End Times, delivered at the Fortress of Megiddo in the Valley of Armageddon. David's Passion for God, delivered at the Ein Gedi Oasis at the Dead Sea. The Eastern Gate in Prophecy, delivered at the Dominus Flevit Church on the Mount of Olives. The Israeli Military in Prophecy, delivered at the grave of Jonathan Netanyahu at the Mount Herzl Cemetery in Jerusalem. David and the Ark of the Covenant, delivered at the Church of the Ark in Abu Ghash. And finally, the album concludes with a powerful sermon about the resurrection of Jesus that Dr. Egan delivered at the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. These 10 sermons are included on two DVD discs in this album. The total running time for all the sermons is two hours and 35 minutes. This inspirational album could be yours for a donation of $25 or more, plus the cost of shipping. To order, call the number you see on the screen or place your order through our website at lamblion.com. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministries, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.